good afternoon if you all are totally amazed by seeing this mental and a lot of you know uh, uh, motivating talk and mental seven cents let us come back to the ground reality that after going back on monday again we need to deal with this of retina and retina so we will we, this is this is the program right now we are doing for last few years and this is this is uh, the concept is that we will discuss with a special situation by our uh, you know senior retinologist and we will have a discussion and the dissection of that case whether anything else can be done in a better way or or that is the best way or anything the inputs so this is the concept of retinos so i'll for that we have our uh, eminent speaker dr manish dr unni dr anirudh uh, dr rajarami reddy dr sunil dr vishal dr aditya dr anirudh agarwal dr himadri and dr mudit a uh, few of common faces was there for last year as well but yes the cases are always a fresh one and uh, uh, for the dissection definitely we have none other than our gurus dr uh, mahesh shanmugam and dr pramod bende so i'll just invite uh, sir to be on the chair please both of you and uh, dr raja narayanan is here raja is not yet here okay he will yeah so this is obviously a problem in iwas always we have the overlapping sessions but anyway we will start and our uh, uh, esteemed panelist dr manisha dr manisha please uh, be on the chair and uh, dr sonal is here she is not yet and uh, dr supriya okay so they will join us shortly so we'll start with our uh, uh, presentation our first presenter today dr unni you will present from here excuse me isi mein isi mein aa jayega nahi nahi change karne ki zarurat nahi hai Let's slides please Okay I'm starting off with a very simple a very simple case uh, with a few questions in it basically uh, uh we call it a tight hug that could make a difference okay so this is the uh, 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 history of a 32 year old man who complains of blurring of vision diagnosed as uh, chronic uveitis and hodgkins lymphoma and treatment he is post allogenic uh, bone marrow graft lots of immunotherapy uh, he had cataract surgery with vitrectomy and uh, sitting colon oil injection elsewhere for a lot of vitreous membranes and uh, for uh, the exact cause was not exactly mentioned and uh, subsequently the patient was evaluated to rule out uh, ocular lymphoma and uh, an infective panel was done so on the visual acuity on presentation was the right eye counting fingers 2 meters and the left eye counting fingers uh, close to face and the iop was extremely low at uh, one in the right eye and two in the left eye so basically on presentation corneal folds were uh, seen due to extreme hypertony and uh, the ubm was uh, inconclusive for epithelial membranes at that point of time so it's a silicon oil filled eye and this was the appearance we're talking about the left eye first there's disc edema some gliosis on the disc extremely uh dilated uh, um uh, uh, veins macular folds and uh, the peripheral uh, choroid choroidals were also uh, shallow choroidals were seen so this was the oct appearance with fluid all over the place uh, the uh, the choroidal contour is bumpy all around i don't have to show you the videos we just basically did an encircleage with a difference that uh, we did the encircleage very anteriorly and uh, we attempted a very shallow buckle effect so this was a concept as we're doing this for as a treatment for uh, hypotony because the iop was not increasing after a very long time 
So I'm just going to skip these two. So this is uh, how it was pre-op. This is a one day post-op. Immediately you can see the vascular tortuosity is less. We couldn't titrate the buckle effect. The buckle effect was rather high actually because we, it was done in a, a, a very uh, soft globe. And uh, this was the first post-op day and this is over time. And subsequently, this is a year later, the vision improved to 6 by 60, there's still gliosis on the disc. The pressure has increased to 7 millimeters of uh, 7 millimeters of mercury. There is a, uh, the uh, buckle effect isn't as uh, uh, significant as it was immediately after surgery. And this is how the retina settled. The disc, there's a gliosis, but the rest of the retina seems uh, relatively okay. There's no macular edema. And this is a comparative pictures of pre-op and uh, post uh, encircledge. So I just want to pose these questions as a point of discussion. Uh, which all scenarios would we think of doing an encircledge for persistent chronic hypertony? Whether we would consider this in the presence of uh, epiciliary membranes? How do we correctly titrate a buckle in the case of extreme hypertony? And how long do you think this effect would uh, sustain, the, uh, the pressure effect would sustain? The pressure effect is obviously not because of the buckle, it's because of the cut, cut down of the uveous scleral outflow, basically. Is silicone oil remo uh, removal justified in this patient who's tottering at a pressure of 6 or 7? And are there any other management options? So thanks, to, uh, thanks, Funi, for the interesting case. And it, this patient had uveitis and uh, yeah. peripheral membranes. Peripheral right? membranes. So, so probably so, that was the first surgery done elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, the UBM subsequently, because of the silicon oil interface, we couldn't pick out uh, much at that point. But the UBM did not show a cyclodialysis cleft as well. No, it didn't show a cyclodialysis cleft. So possibly the traction, which is all around, which is pulling the ciliary body. Yeah. And causing a ciliary body hyposecretion yeah. is probably what is causing it. And by placing an anterior placed buckle and pushing it close to the ciliary, the, the sclera close to the ciliary body, and probably it starts working. Usually, like the belt buckle, we have tried it for patients with cyclodialysis cleft, but not for this particular purpose, is what I would think. But probably the uh, separation is not too much that we are able to get away with it by doing this. Or probably the traction has caused some cyclodialysis clip somewhere, which is also closed because of this. But nicely managed. Very nice outcome as well. Uh -huh. About uh, silicon oil removal, yes, I have removed silicon oil if the pressure is around 6 to 8. Telling the parents, yes, there is a possible time I put the oil back and they do recover. If the UV8 is under control and the proliferation is not progressive, then I think this child should do well with, with this particular uh, treatment itself. <clears throat> it is difficult what you said, but uh, if you have obvious membranes on a past an area <clears throat> and you see the traction on a ciliary area, uh, probably along with the, I mean, complete traction you will not be able to relieve, but definitely it makes sense try and relieve the membranes uh, by manual dissection you can do for that and somebody can help you to depress and you just feel the hole in membrane and start cutting all around. Even patchy removal and some ciliary processes if you are able to relieve, Probably you will be have to you be able to build some pressure that way, but yes, and then adds on belt buckle because combination of both. What Dr. Mahesh said, it will push the sclera coroid inside, and you have a ciliary body there, <coughs> which partly is traction relieved. That helps to some extent. The only thing is uh, risk with that is sometimes you will end up creating dialysis. So probably additional laser and steps if you create a problem, but you have to talk to patient. Yes, otherwise you are going to lose that. But again, I agree with Mahesh, quite a few of these patients, once pressure is somewhere around 5 or 6, and they maintain very well with that, with no hypotony changes, I mean, hypotony maculopathy changes, and I just remain like that, even after silicon oil removal, and long term, they do well, provided again, UITC is strictly under control. Just a, just a uh, wild thought. I mean, this is ex explained very well that if you have a traction in the peripheral area, so if you put an encyclic band with a mild effect, so that the, uh, the you know, choroid comes uh, closer together. And if there is a non-detectable by UVM kind of a ciliary cleft is there by the traction and the ciliary uh, body is not functioning properly. So probably this is the way out where you are putting them together and the ciliary, the gap is also, uh, you know, diminished and the ciliary body is also starts functioning. Vis-a-vis, -vis, subtenon uh, tricot. 
well, no, I, I was about to come to that one thing is when you do UBM, I would also specifically look for ciliary processes. And if they are stunted or not imaging, you can't imagine, that means you know processes are lost. And then whether soft tenon or intravitreal or prolonged steroid therapy will not work in this case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to our next topic, Dr. Himadri. Dr. Himadri is from Shilchar and he is one of the uh, you know, eminent surgeon, with retinal surgeon uh, there. Himadri. Thank you, sir, for this kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, AIOC as well as RKB, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so I'll just go directly to the case. A 32-year-old male, he was one-eyed. He presented to me with a scleral buckle, which had been done in a neighboring country. So this was the picture uh, where I started operating. Uh, the patient also uh, had a full thickness macular hole, as you can see from the scleron. Uh, vitrectomy was started and then I started uh, doing the membrane peeling. All visible membranes uh, were also stained and peeled. The posterior pole was uh, supported by PFCL. This was followed by uh, dye injection and the full ILM peeling was done all around. All the membranes, whichever I could find, were removed. But however, the inferior retina fixed folds could not be uh, relaxed and I had to go for an inferior retinectomy. Inferior retinectomy, however, became a little bit posterior, posterior to the buckle. After this, a uh, fluid air exchange was done. And after removing the PFCL, after the fluid air exchange, I noted that uh, some fluid had accumulated in the posterior pole and the retina had slipped a little bit. So using a flute needle, a very gentle massage, the retina was put in place. Laser was attempted, but the laser marks were not taking very well. Uh, I again went back, went ahead and uh, did some removal of the subretinal fluid. The retina was again nudged into position, but it was trying to slip off. The laser marks were taking up a little bit, but I was not satisfied. This is when I decided to do something which I'll call ab interno supracoroidal buckling. I did a simple cautery in the exposed RP choroid complex and uh, using a 25 gauge straight needle, helon was injected just underneath in the supracoroidal space. As you can see, the Supracoroidal area is lifting up and that is providing a buckle effect to the... So to have a look at it one more time, going into the supracoroidal space directly and injecting helon, this provided a buckle effect to the retinectomy. Finally, this is how it was now looking. He had a pre-existing buckle and the break which was a little bit posterior was now well uh, supported by the buckle. Laser was done and this is how it looked like. This is the break. And this is the buckle effect. After the laser silicon oil injection was done, first post-op, I could actually see the buckle effect. However, over time, the buckle effect went away. At one month post-op, the macula was attached, the retina was attached, buckle effect had gone. The full thickness hole was now closed. Uh, I have tried to do this in a couple of other cases, but one problem which I have faced is getting access into the supracoroidal space using a straight cannula. Uh, here also, there was an inferior break and I wanted a little bit of an inferior support. So I tried doing the supracoroidal helon, but uh, I just couldn't get access into the space. So right now I'm working with a Indian surgical company. We are trying to design a supracoroidal cannula with an olive tip so that I do not damage the sclera while injecting. So this is the first prototype. I hope uh, I'll be able to present a few more cases in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Himachi. So, open for Dr. Sonal. Can I just request, I can see some uh, young faces behind. Can you just come forward and join the discussion? If you have any questions, the stalwarts are here, you can ask them. I think beautifully managed. I do not have uh, much experience about putting heel on the supragural space, but <laughs> I, I mean, uh, very, very well. I'm sure with all, uh, extensive PVR that we see like this and with the help of, uh, you know, our new age cutters and putting uh, the brilliant blue dye uh, under the PFCL, we're able to remove most of it. But in severe PVR cases, inferior retina, where it is not possible and sometimes when you're doing a retinectomy, the edges do slip. So I think uh, this was a very innovative way and you could get away by putting 
getting a helon and it actually worked like a buckle and i think the helon would have taken about one two weeks to kind of uh, completely go uh, but i think very well managed i i i only uh, believe in such cases that i want to know if when you're putting it in the supracoral space the risk of bleeding i mean i'm sure you're doing cautery around that area but then still the risk of bleeding i mean did you encounter anything like that uh, no not yet i have just done uh, three cases till now okay. and in one case i couldn't actually get access to the supracoral space okay and no side effects with the helon no, 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 sitting not, there not yet yeah. sir i think sir has an wild idea of going to the supracoral space long back when we were doing fellowship and fellowship. your comments no i have done supracoral uh, viscoelastic i think that they had they have built raises described this by using a special cannula mm -hmm. which is threaded from anteriorly to posteriorly and he does macular buckle with that mm -hmm. but in absence of having a cannula we i have run uh, supracoral buckle but it's transclear so like the outcome was very nice so congratulations it looked very nice and i have not had the thing of pushing from inside the eye from transclear so yes the, i have injected that's the new thing which i tried yeah, I, i've done that only uh, thing is like i wouldn't probably cauterize a concern of bleeding is there but the cautery also doesn't work too well in a carotid so yeah. if you cauterize also it doesn't stop bleeding that's only one concern like dr sonal was mentioning i would be concerned about if there's a massive bleed that's only concern so i think what had happened was the pvr was removed and the retinectomy was done but when we did the fg PFCL removal, I yeah. think that slippage happened. Yes, so probably yes, if the fluid yes. was kept at the edge, all the fluid would have come. Yeah. But that uh, and because the bucket was there, so it was probably not could not the fluid the fluid could not be kept at the edge to drain the fluid. Yeah. So in that situation, I would have done two things. One is you can do a posterior drainage retinotomy or leave behind a little bit of fluid. The laser could not be done. That was the only issue. Yeah. 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 Ask the patient to maintain prone position. Next day morning, you can do laser yeah, to that. Okay. That's that was one option. Another one was to do a posterior retinotomy, drain the fluid, and then do that. Okay. But of course, like you didn't do all that and come came up with a different solution, which is which is quite novel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Himadji. I think this is, yeah, please. Yeah. Done uh, uh, intravitreal uh, glue for uh, posterior breaks. Uh, would that be an option in a case like that? And he's he's showing that case. Okay. He's showing that case. The problem was will, will come. The problem was not uh, the inability to close the break. Yeah, correct. Instead of that, like the, he had removed all the membranes, so all we had to do was put the oil and maintain the patient. Ask the patient to maintain prone position next day. The retina would have attached, and he could have done laser. Right. So the only concern was that you were not able to do laser. So you right. could have done the laser the next day. So right. Modit's uh, glue, yes, we can put it, but then it's another additional expenditure which is not going to serve any great purpose in this situation. Okay, because only reason about glue is because there were membranes and the retina was taut. Would it? Uh... Okay. <coughs> i just yes. have one question uh, why retina was sleeping i think because the retinectomy was slightly more posterior to the existing buckle yeah not only more posterior probably you need adequate retinectomy on a extending on either side yeah okay so when you as we all being taught always retinectomy is a last resort as far as possible avoid it but once you decide to do it do extensive enough that you relieve all the traction and probably that is what not allowing when you use pfcl also mm -hmm. and when pfcl flattens from posterior to anterior yes laser you would have done under pfcl would have finished that one and comfortably you can do yes problem was there old days where we used to have a, a straight probe now you have a curved laser probe available yeah. so i mean technically you have done excellent job outcome is really wonderful i mean really thank you congratulations to you, congratulations to you. but probably we need not go to that step at all okay can easily be done we have curved laser probe i mean less traumatic approach i would prefer in this case a bigger retinectomy so and if you think the once the helon degrades also then there would be an underfill of uh, oil later there is a risk in the sense uh, that depends on how well the traction was relieved if that's what my question is if there is a residual traction it's flattening under pfcl or because he has increased the buckle light added a helon 
and is temporarily holding it on, but there is still interesting contraction. Probably once it settles down, can come back. That's one way theoretically looking at it. But once retina stretches over a period of time, because it takes long time for the hilum to get absorbed, probably that elasticity slowly stretching out, holding on. That's the logic. Sometimes people say keep PF cell inside the eye for inferior cell for a couple of weeks. That will iron out retina and then take that out. So that may help. So theoretically, probably yes, it will work out. But what you said, that risk is always there, and particularly inferior break. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Aditya Kelkar, and he does not need any introduction, Dr. Aditya from Pune. Thank you, Dr. Rupak, for this kind invitation. I'm going to share with you uh, an interesting case of optic disc split, which developed a recurrence, and I have uh, managed this with the use of the amniotic membrane graft. We live in a mysterious world. The human body is no exception to the mysteries. One such mystery exists in the human eye the optic disc pit. The patient presented to us with gradual progressive diminution of vision since two weeks in her left eye. She had no history of ocular trauma. Anterior segment was within normal limits. Fundus examination revealed presence of optic disc pit associated maculopathy. Swept source OCT confirmed the findings of maculopathy and retinoschisis. The girl was operated with the most preferred modality of treatment, internal limiting membrane peeling and tucking, along with juxtrapapillary laser and SF6 gas tamponade. She recovered well with resolution of the maculopathy and improvement in her visual acuity to 6 by 18. The patient maintained the same vision at 6 months follow-up and there was no evidence of recurrence or any complications associated. However, nine months later, she visited us with regrets. Anterior segment was within normal limits and fundus examination revealed the recurrence of maculopathy secondary to optic disc pit. OCT confirmed the findings of maculopathy. We decided to operate the girl using a 3 mm trephine human amniotic membrane graft due to the larger size of the optic disc pit. After trephination, the graft was stained with brilliant blue and with the help of intravitreal forceps, the graft was directed into the eye and onto the optic disc pit. The visual feedback offered by the intraoperative OCT and the larger size of the graft was helpful in ensuring a snug fit of the patch graft into the optic disc pit. We observed dramatic resolution of the maculopathy and retinoschisis within 48 hours and the best corrected visual acuity improved to 6 by 18. This could be attributed to the already vitrectomized status of the eye along with using a larger graft, which was easy to maneuver into the optic disc pit with the assistance of intraoperative OCT. This treatment modality is new and has the potential to become the mainstay of treatment in treatment nail as well as in patients presenting with recurrence. We live in a mis Thank you. Very well managed, very well managed. Now open for discussion. Sir, MPS sir. It's a very nicely done video. Thank you. Uh, yes, like the, we do come across these recurrences. Only thing is now what I have started doing is to put a sclerol graft. So, autologous sclera, it's very easy to harvest a bit of sclera from the patient's own eye. The advantage is it's a little stiff and so it kind of goes in easily. And if it's a little longitudinal, it's like a rectangle. You, you're able to hold it and stuff it in easier. So, in contrast to the amniotic membrane, which is a little bit flexible, the sclera is easy to push it into the optic disc. Right. Right? But otherwise, like we are forced to do this when they recur. And uh, uh, just an ILM peeling or a laser doesn't seem to work. Otherwise, yes. very nicely done. Video. Sure, thanks. How about the glue? Can you, you have experience with uh, the glue doesn't work? Okay. No, this was just air. I think because it was a recurrence and she's a young girl, only nine, nine year old. We hope that she doesn't get a cataract. So I did not want to use any gas additionally again. And this is her second surgery. So the optic disc pit is actually the next dustbin. 
we put everything into the macula hole <laughs> anterior capsule posterior capsule amniotic membrane Absolutely. now now optic disc <laughs> that's why maybe it's called as a pit <laughs> thank you just uh, just wondering whether do you have any evidence of uh, this optic disc pit any uh, oct or any paper i i have not come across the what is the you know after what happens to this so if you can look into it later i think dr yeah, naresh has a series dr naresh babu he has okay. put this uh, sclera into it. that's what like, he has yes. described and it's published in igu also so uh, wherever our patients have been like the problem is if it's a child we don't get a reliable oct and always the question of whether it's the vitreous or the csf also that that concern also comes into play but i think probably some of the patients both come into play it's there is a bit of csf leakage which is also there and some patients do have this defect between the neurosensory retina and the and the disc that the liquefied vitreous goes inside and contributes to that so both components seem to be there so i think in his series if you see i think that there, there are octs so which this defect is sealed if you stuff the sclera inside and one of the problem is the amniotic membrane the ilm are a little uh, flexible so your forceps the, the sharp edge of the metal part of the forceps may go into the optic okay. nerve but on the other hand if you take a sliver of the sclera hold it here and stuff it inside just the sclera goes into the optic disc pit and then your forceps doesn't touch the optic uh, the disc margin right very nicely described sir dr okay. manisha your comment any specific it's a beautiful uh, video he has shown thank you i don't have personal experience of doing this but i have uh, i know some surgeons who are doing this and they say that amniotic membrane in my town what they are doing it and it's with wonderful uh, mm-hmm. results i think i don't have my personal experience thanks okay uh, i just had a, um, has anybody tried uh, rnfl fenestrations for uh, uh, pit with csr because i saw a, a, it was a case series where they did uh, fenestration they so they with the help of an mbr they make yeah spade had uh, an article on this so they uh, make it over the rnfl so that uh, probably drains the fluid uh, so yeah. just want to know whether I, I, i have not had an experience with this but only problem is the the original problem you are not solving right you are leaving the tap open and opening the drain so close the tap is better than opening the drain and then letting it pass by so i have not tried that and how much of manual damage we are causing by doing an arna for fenestration we don't know i don't have a personal experience with that but something stuffing inside has uh, works and recently i actually did for a coloboma around the optic disc not it's a coloboma bad again the surgery failed and the patient kept it. it's not a odp but at, at the coloboma on edge it's the coloboma actually has two breaks on the uh, the uh, locus minor resistentia and the icm but in that patient because it's recurred and there was nothing else i could do i actually stuffed the sclera and that seemed to work in that patient as well so at least one break i was able to close and the thing uh, attached and uh, yeah, possibly but still you still have to close the tap yeah and uh, I, I has anybody noticed that the recurrence the people uh, people who undergo vitrectomy for uh, this and the people who does not have recurrence are the ones which does not have which had a traction over the area of optic dispit the vitreous traction over the area of optic dispit and the ones who recurred recurred are the ones without that traction have has anybody noticed that just a comment because i have noticed something i also mentioned during the discussion i have a concept right now i think both fluids contribute some patients the csf contributes some patients the which is contrib- some patients i think there is a component of both component of so if the traction is relieved probably the retina goes back and the vitreous component goes down but the csf component doesn't is not taken care of so i think that that part of is taken care of if you plug it thank you right, thank you all and i think it's over to manish now yeah yeah dr manish uh, from nasik he also does not need any introduction and one of the most innovative brain manish please okay. um good morning uh, thank you dr rupak for uh, uh, inviting me to this session i'll be talking about a patient who's a 25 year old male patient who came to the hospital with history of industrial trauma and he gave history that something hit in the eye and went away and he was relatively asymptomatic good visual acuity at presentation uh, he had a self sealed corneal tear and uh, anterior capsular break was seen so uh, but i have i could not see any iofb did b scan b scan also did not show any iofb 
he was not very keen but i insisted on getting ct scan done and uh, we saw this uh, small ifb in pars plana region <coughs> this was the only uh, two cuts where i could see the foreign body the even 1 mm cut above and below uh, i could not see this so the patient was explained that surgery was required and uh, intraoperatively um, i could see this was the self seal tear and anterior capsular break so i thought it there was no, no break of posterior capsule so i thought it was somewhere in the sulcus so initially i tried to uh, use kuglen hook and uh, retract the iris and see but since i could not locate then i went ahead with phaco emulsification removed the uh, it was a standard phaco emulsification not very difficult uh, phaco aspiration was done since the nucleus was very soft or <coughs> and uh, IOL was implanted after uh, standard phaco emulsification i was quite convinced that the uh, this thing is still lying in the uh, sulcus so i again tried using kuglen hook to see if there was this particle i could see i then i tried to uh, enlarge the side port with this thing let's see if i the magnet would pick it up and nothing i was getting little jittery about it i again used uh, capsular hooks to and then depress and see if i could see something nothing there was no i could not see the particle at all again ma magnet by this time i was sweating i had to find something then uh, sutured the uh, side ports and implanted the lens <coughs> implanted the lens in the back i patient was told about this preoperatively that you might require uh, the phaco emulsification if i cannot see the foreign body easily and we will require vitrectomy so then i proceeded with uh, standard 25 gauge vitrectomy and uh, after core vitrectomy and uh, hunting and looking for foreign body i could at last see foreign body in that area in pars plana region like the pvd was induced uh, yes. i could see the foreign body there uh, it was shiny material that you can see so using cutter tip i retrieved the foreign body and uh, brought it in the once i caught it with the cutter got it in visual axis and then tried to retrieve it uh, with check and technique ilm forceps but again it was not easy day it fell down so active aspiration was used to pick it up and then retrieve it i used this uh, microcapsular rexis forceps that we use for uh, rexis and uh, took it out and uh, then that was the end of surgery because the retina was attached the patient had uh, uh, so obvious inspection of periphery and the rest of the uti things and uh, patient had good visual acuity post operatively pseudophakia attached retina so this was the take home messages for me for, from this so all is well which ends well so uh, dr supriya do you come across like this kind of you know for hunting for the foreign body yeah actually it was the lack of break in posterior capsule that kind of uh, you know uh, made me created me. more confusion regarding where yeah. it is located exactly yeah. right um, so we as i mean uh, you know we we kind of investigate all foreign body whenever there's a, a suspicion of a foreign body irrespective we do an x ray or a ct scan if they can afford that if not at least an x ray in most of our patients um the but uh, during clinical examination while you were seeing the fundus you could not see this um, no i okay. was not very uh, aggressive with depression because as you saw there was a, a self sealed corneal tear yeah so yeah. i didn't want to disturb that in trying to uh, so i asked for ct scan even what about an ultrasound uh, preoperatively no it was done it i don't have the picture but it was done and 
it was could not be seen it was very anterior very small foreign body so could not be seen in the scan also okay okay so ubm could have been another option at that point of time Probably but UBM again with the ceiling, if i had then uh, i might have been, we might have picked it up but so uh, we'll ask uh, mpv madam is here ma'am uh, in this kind of situation with self sealed cornea wound is it safe to go ahead for ubm at that point of time Nice video, Manish. Uh, you need not do a UBM if you don't have it. What yeah. you can do is over the closed lids, you fill a glove with uh, water. Okay. Use it as a standoff, and then there is a okay. chance you can see the anterior segment. And the, I am saying glove with water because it's a wound. Otherwise, you just put lots of jelly. Mm. Use as a standoff. Sometimes, if you are worried the jelly will slip, you can just put some cylinder or something around the eye. it should be large enough because the locations horizontally you get artifacts from the lateral orbital rim so you have to be a little careful you don't have to do a ubm we can manage with a standoff the question is that whether the ubm can be done in this kind or probably of avoid it because a self sealed is never really self sealed so i would avoid it sir any comment ev sir i think excellent man i think very well managed case i would put it that way so yes but basically history is more important and when your clinical finding a strongly suggesty of foreign body obviously you need to search for you need to look for and i think you did a good job i think you could not what your limited thing, i mean could not become an ultrasound at least as you ensure that you ask for another imaging modality to ensure it is there and then obviously once you know it is there uh, then Uh, the way you handle i think it's i think the way, one of the best way i would say could have been done okay we had uh, i think one pub, uh, presentation uh, i remember something like a uh, some fake while doing fake chop and then tip of that because of uh, ultrasound energy got uh, broken up and that lodged in a somewhere in a zonules uh, and they could not find during that surgery and they didn't realize and then when how end of the surgery see the tip is missing and that's the one could pick up on a ubm but that was later on not uh, when a fresh injury we have that's just another incidence i remember of sitting somewhere in a zone but this foreign body is definitely when sitting very anterior like extremely difficult to get it but what is important you need to know that he's like uh, looking at the history and another common location what you have is uh, ricochet injury when injury foreign body hits somewhere and just fall down because of irate posture always always we otherwise also look at 6 o'clock location somewhere past pana so but yes history is more important than only you are going to search for it and you keep on searching okay good job sir uh, one more twist is here so if we ct scan would not have detected it so if it is in between so overlapping ct scan we usually do advise one for this kind of situation yes. so suppose uh, the ct scan would not have detected it so in that situation Uh, because the history and the clinical picture is suggestive of intraocular foreign body so is it wise to do a vitrectomy plan for vitrectomy as an initial primary phase to oh, after uh, the feco oh. mp sir yeah. <clears throat> but like you you need an imaging to confirm that right yes. so if you want probably a, a closer cut ct scan would have to be done to confirm that it is there or do a careful ultrasound to find that there it is there something before we intervene because unless uh, there is something that is necessary for us to go inside right yeah. because it could be in the orbit also so it's better to have an imaging which confirms that yeah, couple, but, yeah, sorry go ahead yeah. a couple of uh, come like uh, manish said he was sweating that he couldn't find the foreign body but then we went and said coolly induced the pvd if it gone inside i would have first thing i would have done is to depress to see where the foreign body is before i go ahead that to induce the pvd second thing was same thing happened that like uh, my one of my colleagues removed the foreign body and lost it so you know unless you show the patient's family that foreign body so he told the sister please arrange for a foreign body <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure so sure. i had shown a very similar case uh, yesterday in one of the talks where i had a pass plane of foreign body the patient didn't even have a wound of entry the lens was clear 6 by 6 n6 vision and i could locate the foreign body on depression and i marked it with a marker and then i went externally i opened up the sclera like a trap door okay. and removed the foreign body from there so neither the lens was sacrificed nor i had to do a vitrectomy there 
and the patient i did a little bit of cryo around the end at the end but that was also really not required because the pass plana location of the foreign body did not involve any interference with the retina that is big, but here i was not sure i was quite convinced correct, that correct. it was it probably in zonul somewhere correct. so i was not sure where to open you know so this one way of probably approaching if the pass plana if is the location of the foreign body uh, can this, probably go external yes. that is you are intraoperatively location that's no, what you are talking preoperatively preoperatively on depression i could see the foreign body sitting on the pars plana and the patient was fake kick i uh, showed the video i think in one of the sessions yesterday yeah i do agree but if the vitreous is liquid enough then there is always a possibility of shifting from even yes. after depression also shifting so from one place to patient, the other young patient around 25 year old with a foreign body like that i think an external approach could make sense instead of sacrificing the lens and then the vitreous causing a pvd which itself is a you know is a challenge in a young patient first. good good so that is another way of handling of this kind of situation no, actually uh, what is said is i agree with him because particularly when embedded foreign body it's know. already embedded there so you actually and you know exact precise location in fact you are not disturbing vitreous okay you straight cut on the foreign body area Uh, and generally this type of foreign body if little bit long duration because you say you could not see interside that means already it's probably a prolonged duration already encapsulated so in fact you are not entering vitreous cavity at all if you are localizing if localization is correct i think that's that's the way it works and also to previous question i think i am i appreciate the most important thing you did is the counseling of patient that because on table these things are always unpredictable so counseling and priming them that i may need vitrectomy i think that's the best thing i think uh, you did actually is very very important yes. to add to what somik mentioned i have also done this it, what you can do is to make a little larger sclerotomy and use your magnet outside so what happens is like it kind of because when you are trying to open the choroid and the other ciliary body is when it may fall so you can use the magnet and trans uh, choroidal tissue it kind of pulls up and there's a little tenting of the tissue then you can slice <laughs> over and remove it so you can use the magnet from outside also uh, so instead of using a 20 diopter lens when i can't depress i usually take a 28 diopter or a 30 diopter what i use in rop patients so i don't know if anybody i am easily able to see up to the ora and beyond uh, with 30 or 28 diopter lens and that helps to locate if you cannot depress this is my experience i don't know what others do actually in this i i agree with you yeah this is this is this is another good option of for depression okay, okay. so thank you thank you we'll move on to our next uh, speaker dr raja rami reddy dr raja please yeah thank you dr rubak uh, this is an unusual case of a uh, that i finding that I encountered during a erm surgery this is a 75 year old bilateral uh, pseudo phakic patient uh, who came with a his history of give, receiving a, at least 20 in, intravitreal injections in both the eyes uh, for treatment of diabetic macular edema and uh, she was an anti this is how she presented she is an anti glaucoma medications uh, two drugs managing is an erm uh, that we see and uh, offered her a vitrectomy and membrane peeling uh, to decrease the macular edema and during the vitrectomy after core vitrectomy i uh, found something hitting the probe in the uh, retinal periphery as you can see and i always do some amount of vitrectomy uh, under under air and i quickly realized that there is an implant in the retinal periphery but it's only slightly different it's a yellowish in color and it was a uh, slight yellowish in color and it's a size is not is different it's a bat shaped one end of it is thin the other one is filled with material and large and uh, as the patient was also and i presumed it was azuridex while during the surgery I since it is already having a glaucoma i planned to i thought of uh, removing it and not leaving it alone there there were some challenges during the surgery in uh, removing this particular implant yeah i tried removing it cutter and i had to treat it uh, use pfcl to protect the for i used all sorts of uh, duty cycles to remove it then i uh, to eat it up in the vitreous cavity it was it wasn't very easy and uh, ultimately i also thought of doing a handshake technique holding it with one forceps and doing uh, using cutter of uh, decreasing the cut rate increasing the suction all things but it wouldn't simply cut this particular uh, implant or material at all so then i realized uh, I, had, i had to take it out so i used this I aligned it along the long axis of the trocar and then removed it. 
much later probably on the second day while i was discussing this particular case i colleagues are then continued ahead with the routine erm surgery and uh, so ultimately i realized this is this is a uh, this is a flu flu slow nystatinide implant illuvian as after reviewed the literature it has a non bioerodible implant wall made of uh, polyamide that is used for making hap- uh, haptics of the eye wall one end of it is a non permeable plug and the other through the other end is a permeable pva membrane through which fluid goes and then it dissolves the uh, f- uh, flu slow nystatinide molecules and the drug is slowly released over the period of uh, uh three years that's what they would say that accounts for the difference in size of the implant one end of it is thin the other one and uh, the other thing there's no case so basically it was an illuvian implant there's no case report of illuvian explantation published in literature and the other way we could have probably managed is try to do a phragmatome instead of trying to dream and uh, there's no way i could have uh, and how could you could have left it alone i didn't think of it because it there was already having a glaucoma on uh, significant damage on glaucoma drugs and uh, the only way we can pick up this is probably do indirect and indentation in all cases thank you yeah, so this is an iatrogenic foreign body uh i i don't think that it is possible to cut it with the cutter or even with that so probably the easier way to take it out uh, is, is is sir it wasn't cutting i mean uh, it was not cutting not, at all not, it is absolute right that's what i told holding it forceps in one hand and f- the other cutter that's what i tried for 5 minutes so yeah. anybody uh, mudit uh, do you have any experience of you know illuvian injection so we have given illuvian we have given that but i have don't have an experience of removing it i believe anirudh has one he'll share it but the ozudex implant surprisingly is removable with the alveolar yes, cutter yes. and a 23 gauge cutter if you take it you can just eat it and on to illuvian so that's why when i saw this i thought that maybe sir is dealing with a illuvian implant not ozudex because ozudex is easily you can take it away i have no experience of removing an illuvian implant but maybe anirudh yeah i had one patient but i'm surprised that it did not get cut with the cutter because i could easily disintegrate it with the cutter it's non biodegradable but it's quite easily disintegrate it disintegrates with the cutter so I'm quite surprised. I'm not sure uh, if it is uh, maybe an older version of Illuvian or maybe she got it many many years ago. So could be. Could so be. I because had a patient who had multiple ozodex for vein occlusion and then ultimately developed uh, a recurrent edema, received Illuvian and had endophthalmitis. So I cleared the exudates and with that the uh, Illuvian implant was very easily disintegrated. so what exactly the material is of uh, illuvian that uh, yellowish i'm not sure what it, it is, is called it's polyimide that's what uh, yeah. is polymer polyimide something yeah. like polyimide these things is like a old remember bashan lam first came with a 25 gauge canora system and those that material that yes. semi translucent it yeah, is yeah. something like it is biodegradable it but rem supposed to be remain in eye and not non biodegradable sorry oh. but it was not but ha- not harmful to eye leaving it behind but it just happened because you are inside and it's not yeah. much functional you want to take out but yes probably what happened like you use a 25 gauge system 25 gauge system probably that is a reason probably see what you say but looking it at video but it is quite big in size when when uh, you showed the video it yeah, was yeah. quite big in size no no that's so. why because it is big and 25 system you are using it keeps on slipping see it was jumping not able to grasp it because probably. of slippery surface probably uh, yes hmm. uh, low cut old okay. 20 gauge I... cutter you would have been able to cut it easily, easily <laughs> rather, rather than that one but so, i think that's the way you don't want to struggle or don't allow it to jump here and there and yeah. cause retinal damage abrasions uh, i think at very well managed care rather i would say so probably sometimes going back to the older days may maybe wiser How thank you thank back, you how long back did the patient have the implant it doesn't know sir uh, he she has history of ti she doesn't bring the old record she is from saudi arabia and uh, she has given the history of taking 20 injections intravitreal injections for diabetic macular edema in both the eyes uh-huh. the last injection she has taken was probably 2 months back before i operated in march so, so that would probably so at least by the way the amount of drug that was there i think maybe it was at least 9 months uh, mm. older that because they significant probably have been upset no like you removed the drug which is supposed to have been <laughs> i haven't disclosed that i removed this particular thing for the patient because she doesn't know uh, all i said was removing that and surprisingly this patient had rebound macular edema 
at the end of 3 weeks after surgery okay, that's like expectable what, uh, because what anirudh was mentioning i think it's if it's spent it's easier to remove rather than if it's not spent it's probably difficult yeah. to remove yeah. because once it is spent it just remains as a thin transparent shell yeah yeah, yeah it's like what this one this was more in this case half of it was spent and half of it was uh, yeah. full so yeah. that means it had the drug inside but once it goes away it's just a transparent polygon sort of very mm. transparent yeah. shell sort of a thing okay thank you thank you dr raja but those of you who have used it like how many of these you can leave behind sir we we have not left any right. of those behind this was actually we no, because right now ozdex also i call it a space junk you see patients have had some four or five ozdex this is space junk inside the vitreous cavity so ilivian also is going to leave behind much more space junk uh, yeah but now yeah because ilivian but actually supposed to last for 3 years okay. approximately so you don't inject that frequently i know if the patient has spent 10 years uh, on yeah. treatments it like at least three inside yeah yeah it will be it will be the only patient i know who has there's only one patient we have who has received two of them this was a period of four years so she had got one earlier and then she was a part of our uvita study where we had given her one of the injections so whenever she counts fingers she says two i have not <laughs> got to count fingers in her as yet but i'll check it next time sir okay. Okay, we'll we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mudit. Dr. Mudit does not need again any introduction from LB Prasad Hyderabad. And I think uh, Fawn is trying to take over science because uh, court martial is going on over there, and you can hear. So don't get distracted with those sounds. Please concentrate here, Dr. Mudit. Yeah, all right. So thank you so much. So I'll be talking about one case where we use fibrin glue in one of our hydrogenic breaks. We have till now used fibrin glue quite extensively. in lot of our cases of rheumatoidogenous retinal detachments with some pretty nice results but this was a patient who was a 45 year old known case of sle and when she had come to us she had got a vitreous hemorrhage inside her eye and this was a patient which was being operated by my fellow over here and initially he was doing a pretty nice job he was able to remove most of the hemorrhage pretty easily so i'll just skip to that part but it's only over here later on that the trouble occurred not here but i'll just show you here this is when the trouble and you can see observe this thing happening over here i'll just play it again over here so there was one area of traction he pulled upon it and he ended up creating one large pocket of fluid and not only did he create a pocket of fluid but he also ended up creating one break over here so this is when i had to step in we did an intraoperative oct over here and much to our dismay we found that this pocket of fluid was there but also over here inferiorly there was subretinal fluid now in this case so that's when we went ahead did the routine steps of draining of the pocket of fluid over here after draining it we did a laser around the break and completed a peripheral retinal photocoagulation because this was a patient of sle with sclerosis vessels in all quadrants so subsequent to doing a laser all over now the options were what do we do for this pocket of fluid and i'll just skip this part but i'll come to the main part later on so after that after flattening the retina under air we just put one drop of fibrin glue over the break waited for 3 minutes the coagulum forms lifted the coagulum reposited over the break comfortably and after depositing the coagulum over the break we just left this patient under fluid so we switched on the fluid subsequently and that's it just switched on the fluid and this is how the patient's eye was at the end of the surgery with an attached retina and a coagulum covering the break and this is how the patient is on the first post operative day with an attached retina and a co coagulum of fibrin covering the break over here and this is how the patient is at one week with a visual active 2025 maintaining now at 3 months and even 6 months of follow up so the question was that if we see a pocket of fluid and hydrogenic break which has been created with unfortunate an extension of fluid even in the periphery what do we do can we just laser and leave it behind do we use gas or oil because this was inferior and also had an inferior srf and luckily for us now we can use fibrin glue and that works very well allows for a good visual recovery no positioning no gas or tamponades needed so in lot of these hydrogenic breaks now i think fibrin glue can come to our rescue thank you so much sir mps sir yeah very nicely managed but uh, uh, i would have probably left air and then yeah. prone position should have got better because the traction has been relieved but on the other hand if the traction has not relieved fibrin glue again is not going to no, work no if the traction is not relieved then obviously you can't so right. it's just that in these cases again instead of putting air 
leaving giving the patient prone positioning waiting for 3 to 4 days for it to resolve or sometimes if there is more fluid and then putting oil or gas i think now these cases can be very easily managed with just putting one drop of fibrin glue and in fact in these cases now we just leave them under fluid we don't even put yeah my only versus is that like uh, fibrin glue cost money air doesn't cost money so luckily for me i have got a cornea or running uh, next correct. to me so that's, i can get it that's, that's what happens but whenever i ask my cornea colleague they said no 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 i just used it is for the answer i get so that's a problem okay. so that's the reason i don't use it that too frequently but uh, given an option even if i don't have to charge the patient yes i would have used the bin too thank you dr bhudit i mean isn't it also good to leave at least uh, come do an fg at the end of vitrectomy so that your wound closure and all things are better in that regard at least rather than trying to it will also help the patient maybe you can do partial air if you feel like so sometimes i think so yeah, but that is for the closure of your vitrectomy wound but so that you already day. when that that benefit is there with air of better wound closure i know but then you will have to give positioning to your patient i understand that it's just that i'm saying that for hydrogenic breaks now you don't even need to resort to using air or giving positioning or gas or oil lot of these can be managed very well just with the biggest fluid. advantage is leaving the fluid fluid filled at the first day that's just an extension of that thought only so suppose a situation of a diabetic vitrectomy and you have an hydrogenic break and you have lasered and those areas of uh, break which is usually very friable right now so even if you do break there is always a possibility of micro break to develop there so just putting up you know glue in a bigger area can it you know serve the purpose so to an other, i have not done it in a lot of diabetes i've just done it in one and there was just one small break but i have had colleagues who have done it and i have not but they have told me that they have had a good outcome dr malika goel probably has or probably will share some of her cases on one of the sessions here later on and one of my colleague dr brijesh thakkar has also used it to be honest i have not till now used it but they have tried it and they have found good favorable outcomes in that but since i have not so probably unfair on my part to comment much so uh, actually uh, out of the topic so can we use it in a uh, fresh rigmatogenous rd with no pvr after vitrectomy that's what we are doing we have done it in around 55 to 60 cases fresh rds one break two breaks three breaks localized to just one or two quadrants put fibrin glue leave it they work very well dr mudit's article is published already it's there i am not too sure if you can leave us a what you are talking about yes. right like uh, it doesn't stay like that because when you put it there it tends to gravitate posteriorly so you have to roll the eye towards the break and then put one drop wait for it to coagulate then put the second drop of the other component of the thing and coagulate and despite which it will still flow that's what the mud it shows that you drag it back to the to the break and then trim it so if you want to leave one coating i am not too sure if it works too well and like the basic problem is you have to leave traction fibrin glue is not a not or like silicon oil is not an alternate to not a leave traction so probably that is the take home what sir has exactly told ki without you this this cannot be a substitute of or doing a proper vitrectomy so unless until you cannot get away by doing an incomplete vitrectomy or not relieving the traction and putting the glue just to add what again to reemphasize what is saying you obviously going to do retinopexy it is not substitute to retinopexy but yes, because sir. it works as a tamponade to laser to take over so what your question was micro breaks the tiny breaks microzer intentionally what you do for subretinal fluid injection or air injection and generally do it most of the time through healthy retina so there is more like a 41 or 39 gauge cannula it just splits retina rather than actually creating break but what you are talking about diagetic where it is like a stretch breaks retina already thin out probably they may not close just only with the fibrin temporarily close and once they come out probably it goes back again okay so uh, yeah. whether i mean of course we do not have answer that completely but i think there are two different scenarios we are dealing with yeah, yeah. here basically it's a substitute for tamponade you have yeah. done a laser you have settled the retina now instead of using oil gas or uh, fluid air whatever you use for tamponade instead of tamponade fibrin is basically just a alternative tamponade holding it till laser takes over Oh, thank you dr anil dr anil agarwal uh, surgical management for young diabetic type 1 diabetic so very good afternoon thank you sir for the opportunity um i'm going to be showing you a case where, where i managed a type 1 uh, patient young patient with uh, proliferative disease and the, really the essence of the treatment here is how meticulously you need to keep going keep Uh, dissecting and then ultimately you will reach a point where you can have a retina without any traction 
So uh, this is a patient who has multiple comorbidities. He was referred to us because uh, the visual acuity was only light perception in right eye and quite low in the left eye as well. He has multiple systemic comorbidities with uh, dialysis, end-stage renal disease, myocardial ischemia, hyper hyperkalemia. So multiple things going on. So generally, we take these patients under general anesthesia. And as you can see here that this patient had uh, a significant amount of vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, and on the ultrasound, really, the, the retina probably had a lot of uh, focal adhesions and detachments. I'm just going to go back, sorry. So here, probably there are a lot of focal adhesions in multiple places. So uh, most of the retina specialists, they thought that this is a patient of total detachment. But, uh, but really, there was not much after uh, movements uh, of the retina. Like when I did the ultrasound, I did not feel that it's a total detachment and I thought I should give it a chance. So uh, this patient, uh, when I planned for the surgery, I planned with a 25 gauge system. That's what I usually use. And uh, I also thought that we might require bimanual uh, chandelier. And in such patients, usually uh, my threshold is now very low for using bimanual dissection. So uh, the steps of the surgery, very standard. So we start off with uh, three port uh, vitrectomy. And this was the appearance of the retina. So there was a lot of uh, posterior, uh, and this is what we usually see in the Middle East where you have a lot of uh, focal, flat neovascularization and a lot of membranes involving the uh, posterior pole. And, and these patients, therefore, they have uh, a lot of crumpled up retina. So at some point, I'm really tempted also to use an additional buckle in certain cases. So um, after clearing the core vitreous, you can see I often use uh, the cutter itself to start my dissection i go ahead with a proportional reflux i titrate my proportional reflux to get within the membranes and this is how i go on dissecting with the cutter so once i identify a plane i use proportional reflux to uh, create a space and then along the, uh, along the space i go ahead and i dissect so i think it requires multiple uh, amounts of uh, you know dissection you keep dissecting keep uh, relieving the traction it might take several hours for you to do it so this amount of flat neovascularization it actually pulls up and you can see multiple retinal folds all coming to the center so once I have uh, achieved adequate, you know, uh, dissection, at least some part of the retina is free. I use the forceps, but I don't use it too much because I am really afraid of iatrogenic breaks. And in these patients, when you have iatrogenic break, it can change the course. The outcomes can completely change. So you have to be very careful, like the, the case that Mudit showed. When you are pulling, you have to be very careful in pulling. So I often use curved scissors to get again, get to the plane. So this, uh, you can do it with the bimanual or sometimes with unimanually, like using just one hand, you can probably try to uh, cut from the focal adhesions and uh, get away without, you know, causing a lot of traction and iatrogenic breaks. So, of course, you have to keep staining. So I usually try to stain at, uh, at least uh, twice, once with Ramsin alone. If I'm not satisfied, I can stain again with Ramsin alone. And in surgeries where I'm doing a lot of dissection or where there is a previous laser has not been done, I often combine it with, uh, you know, uh, the ILM peeling. So I go very conventionally. My approach is very conventional. I like to use Tano's uh, diamond dusted to, to peel as much as possible, to remove as much as hyaloid from all the areas as possible. And you will reach a point where you can easily identify a layer after layer and the hyaloid will eventually come out. So at this point I'm doing the ILM peeling. I, I uh, did stain with the brilliant blue dye. So this is probably after two and a half, three hours. You have to keep uh, keep at it. You have to try to keep dissecting as much as possible. And at the end of it, I could leave the patient without any tamponade. There was no iatrogenic break. So 
this is the appearance post operatively so i think uh, i had a good outcome but the the key point i think is to be very meticulous and keep dissecting so i just like to invite any comments from excellently done surgery dr anirudh uh, sir excellent surgery i would say uh, only thing is uh, when you have young patients when i dealing with particularly is a 20 year 21 year old lot of other issues so i am always more aggressive when i do laser and co and because they know we they come back with recurrence hemorrhage peripheral yeah. proliferation all those things and quite a few patient nowadays with all our experience even we go old days we used to do 20 kg yes, arc if i can't reach periphery particularly because you don't want to sacrifice lens obviously the yeah, these are young patient and if good dissection you have done with a curved laser probe you can reach far yeah. periphery and rare situation where i cannot reach so I, I i won't hesitate now you want do enter cryopexy to ensure that uh, they won't come Safe. back with because some i want to be aggressive and deal with this and otherwise it's very very I, I had to actually quickly finish the laser because his potassium levels were critically high oh, at that point so i in the post operative period then i i had to eventually complete the yeah, laser good. Uh, very nicely done surgery except that like uh, a little bit easier could have been done if you can just go through your video i'll just show you in one particular place you have, you have dissected all around but there's a membrane posterior pole onto the disc little bit before that before prior prior ah just stop there so at this point in time actually you can come from the disc you can peel from the disc this and then and then what happens is there is a second membrane inferiorly that's why it's not folding up i would have used the fold back technique very very easily in this so you peel this from the disc and then keep the cutter here it folds back and then right. it, it it would be over even without using a scissors or a forceps so the direction as to how the port faces actually makes a big difference in diabetic vitrectomy so you how you keep it and then it folds back so here at this point in time and then subsequently you peeled it towards the disc and to uh, like uh, away from the disc nasally and all that but if you peel at the disc and bring it over this side it will bleed at the disc that's okay but then it will roll over and the whole thing will come off with the cutter itself excellent point of course Thank there you. are a thousand ways of doing it but like very beautifully done surgery but that will save you another half an hour right also probably again it's a controversial every all of us have, have again their own way to peel or not to peel ilm in these eyes and because once traction is relieved i not necessarily i would go and peel ilm in every diabetic if adequate traction is relieved especially young patient this is a young patient so just one uh, last question so whether uh, autologous serum would have been uh, not in this case it's not, not that bad not to use autologous case. serum because like there was pvd in the periphery so we have this once which there's absolutely no pvd with like thousands of attachments from the disc to the periphery and the whole posterior hyaloid is vascularized that is when i would have used autologous plasmin plus uh, uh, in, uh, like uh, anti vegf but this is this is not too bad and it's a vascular i think probably dr anero that given an anti vegf prior to the surgery also okay you're given anti vegf prior to the surgery yes ah that's right because this is not too bad yeah. can, can i ask one question like in traditionally we don't usually apply a band in patients of uh, proliferative but not in which cases in this patient's not necessary because the hyaloid was separated from the fibrovascular proliferation to the periphery so right. high, the, the what do you call the truncation of the cone was possible so in this patient it's not really necessary and there was no vascularization in the periphery like periphery. dr pramod mentioned i would have done taken the laser up to the ora but this patient doesn't require a band so but if the same fibrous tissue was extending from this anteriorly and you are not able to dissect beyond a point anteriorly and the risk of iatrogenic break is there that that i would have supported with the buckle okay. sometimes it's a solid silicone also so that isolate that area of traction from posterior so that it doesn't progress but in this patient it was not really required yeah. i agree yeah, totally i agree what dr mahesh said and what you said i also do sometimes because fake guy an extreme periphery thin retina and with is isolated island and creating iatrogenic break which were not happened till now you compromise lot of things rather than then removing that just supporting either segmental or inter buccal or egmoid band I, i i would go for that because there are some cases who you do everything but in the periphery you have a frond of new vascularization which grows it keeps growing sometimes under oil or yeah, after your vitrectomy and maybe if you support it with a buckle that's what we do that's what mm -hmm. we do it definitely works very well because having a recurrent bleed and all those things definitely it it works i won't hesitate doing that and that concept of if you add bell buckle already compromise uh, circulation they will go to anterior uh, segment ischemia and all those things 
you are not going to have really tight band so generally it doesn't happen that much thank you thank, thank you so this uh, time is an important factor so we'll we'll move on Just to one one second uh, yeah. no to give uh, avastin pre operatively when you're not able to see the uh, kind of detachment would uh, would you do that in uh, uh, was this fresh vitreous hemorrhage or old vitreous hemorrhage i'm not sure anirudh dr anirudh uh, is it a fresh or a old vitreous hemorrhage that's what she is asking us so would you give an avastin pre operatively would that not complicate things operating within 3 to 5 days really doesn't complicate things so longer than that yes of course we have to make sure that the patient is fit for surgery because he got so many so much of systemic yeah, system comorbidities make yeah. sure the patient is fit for surgery and give the anti vegf and take the patient up for surgery 3 days later to 5 days later doesn't increase the trd yeah dr anirudh please just a small uh, introduction of the case this patient had come with a, a trauma due to a moving fan which fell down in his head and also injured the eye so it was a hypotonus eye total high femur and suspecting as a open uh, globe rupture we explored as you can see it's a total high femur and we can we can make out this uh, scleral rupture the globe rupture and uh, plantar suture and try to see the extent of this uh, globe rupture because what i was suspecting that this might go underneath the uh, muscle insertion and that's what uh, it actually happened and luckily i had my pediatric ophthal uh, colleague with me so we disinserted this uh, muscle to get hold of the globe rupture yeah you can see this is the extent of the rupture which has gone behind the muscle insertion now we got the total extent of the rupture and could uh, do the suture closed it and uh, as it was an open globe we had done an ultrasonography very light uh, ultrasonography and uh, what we saw is was there was a mild vitreous hemorrhage so uh, we thought we will do and uh, will drain the high femur and in a second stage if required we will do the vitrectomy but uh, just to see what is the there inside it was full of surprises you can see there was a choroidal detachment there was a vitreous hemorrhage along with the detachment so we had to do in a single step operation so without removing the cataract it was very difficult to uh, approach the case so remove the cataract remove the lens to be precise put an ac maintainer because there was a choroidal detachment and this was the thing inside it was a dense vitreous hemorrhage you can see a choroidal rupture also over there it was extremely difficult to take out the blood and along with the total detachment and the, there was a just opposite to the ruptured area there was a suprachoroidal hemorrhage as well it took a long time to dissect out the vitreous from the underlying detached retina gradually got hold of the posterior hyoid and once we cleared the posterior pole i put the pfcl to flatten the retina at least the posterior pole and dissect the periphery now we have put the pfcl i can we can see the retina but there is a lot of hemorrhage in the periphery then did a laser
you can see the supracorneal hemorrhage in the periphery and did a direct uh, silicon oil PFCL exchange. This is the last bubble of PFCL we are taking off. This was the picture after the operation after putting the silicon oil. And this is the picture uh, after three weeks and it did pretty well. The vision improved from perception of light to 624. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anirudh. It was really a challenging situation for tackling from the anterior segment to the posterior segment, all the layers. Any, any quick comment, Dr. Manisha? No, I think uh, extremely well handled case. These are difficult situations, definitely. You are lucky enough that cornea was reasonably clear. Otherwise, cornea that, was good. Yeah, otherwise it adds on. And yes, uh, the moment you have anything clear going posterior to muscle line, then you know it's beyond aura and then you are going to face some problem. Just wanted to know where was the break intraoperatively? In the, in the periphery. In a, uh, that was retina was torn there. Yeah. So because what happened when it was we just the opposite side where the corridor rupture happened. It's just the opposite side. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And when you have this impact and force is inside out, vitreous is getting pulled out pulled there, and exactly 180 degree apart, you have either retina is torn or that retina will be incarcerated in your injury so side. That is not there. Okay, for, and I think you handle well, and because taken for early, because you allow now this vitreous slowly can, yeah. if retina would not have discharged also. On tables, I mean, pre surgery ultrasound shows there's no detachment, but sometimes when you start pulling it's, it up, it's uh, difficult to do an ultrasound in a gopal globe. Uh, no, I agree. Yes. Yeah. So, no, no, what I mean is, suppose you are done primary wound, but decision yeah. was good. What I mean is that you are taken at the same time and we know it's gone posteriorly. But yeah, there are two ways of looking at it. You do at the same time going in, if tissues are inflamed, the risk of intraoperative hemorrhage is very choroidal, tissues can bleed like mad. Sometimes it happened with me also once I had to close the case because we were bleeding like mad. So the advantage of taking late is obviously if, like you have a reduced inflammation, you assess well, but then the, you have a risk of retina getting pulled later on, which you would not have been detached earlier. But I think looking at the case, the way you handle, I think the decision was right. Yes, induction, induction of PVD, mobile retina. But PFCL, I think, help us out most of the time now in this situation. Done, we're done very well, I think. Nothing more to add, actually, the way you did. Yeah, I think that, that's the question. Uh, two things. One is, do we intervene right away or do we wait? Yeah. So, unless there's a foreign body, you can close it, wait, and then subsequently do it as well. The advantage would have been, we'd have been able to probably save the lens. That's one. And the PVD induction would have occurred by itself and the hydrogenic brakes would have been. That was better. the initial plan. But when I saw that it's a total detachment, with supracoronal hemorrhage, so I thought. Uh, but sometimes let's deal these it, things uh, settle down. Right? It's not all not all the time. It goes into a PVR in a matter of a week or ten days. It sometimes it settles. Could down. have been planned after seven days as well. Possible, possible. And uh, another comment is like even if we disinsert the muscle, you get disinserted. We don't need a pediatric ophthalmologist to disinsert the muscle. <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to it, so I thought it's nothing but when you can do vitreoretinal surgery, <laughs> cut the retina. I'm sure the muscle will cut get cut as well. <laughs> sir, sir, two questions. Thank here. You. Uh, is there a role of in the primary setting just putting an encircling band over it because there's a tear which has gone posteriorly after you've repaired it put an encircling band and maybe it's, it was an hypertonus eye yeah. actually and the second thing it's is a lot of times in these cases just leaving PFCL for one week and then coming back and doing a second surgery second stage will also help a lot because that one week or two weeks of PFCL will also help in taking care of the corridors which have happened and will reduce the inflammation. So the second time when you go ahead and do the surgery, that time it becomes much more easier for doing a laser, taking care of the peripheral membranes and then just replacing PFCL. That's what a lot of times we do. Just leave PFCL for at least one week to two weeks and then go ahead and do a second surgery. Yeah, I've never tried it actually. And it was a hypotenuse I you a and it's, it's difficult to do. It, it would have been we, we a easy to maintainer the, and do a pass minimal lensectomy. For the future, uh, when we remove the oil, we can easily put the lens. So we were just trying if that is possible. The other option was Lensectomy. No, I know. I, the, the debate is can go on for long, but again, <laughs> time you. is restricted. They should have given me as more time, Dr. Vishal. <coughs> Sir, 
sorry about that. So thank you, Dr. Rupak, for having me here. So I had presented around uh, eight uh, uh, cystic sarcosis uh, in 2019. These were uh, I operated in the last one year. So these, hence the name Farm Fresh Eggs. So the first case was uh, these are you know curious presentations of subretinal cystic sarcosis. The first was a submacular uh, cyst. He was a young gentleman, 30 year old, and was treated for toxoplasma, was treated for for choroiditis, uh, and was on and off for heavy dose steroids and uh, posterior septinence but it was a no-brainer it was a cystic sarcosis and you can see the oct you can see the cyst wall you can see the live movements under the light and uh, there was a lot of exudation the vision was really poor so we went inside and and it was a I, he was a young patient so the pvd induction was a little challenge so we used a faucet to create a cleavage plane as the uh, as the cyst was quite large i was you know wary of creating a macular hole so i just uh, you know shifted the hyaloid with the shaft of the cutter and not really pulled it with the active aspiration to uh, to create a pvd and after that uh, as it was a little away from the fovea uh, near the arcade uh, created a, a small retinotomy now what happened uh, when the retinotomy was created after the diathermy was that the fluid ingressed into the subfoveal space and actually it is pushing away from the from the flute needle so uh, when i go inside it's you know moving away uh, from the tip of the flute needle so a gentle nudge towards the retinotomy, a retinotomy and it came inside and once it's engaged into that uh, passive aspiration it comes out uh, spontaneously with you know the amoeboid movements which is very characteristic of these of the cyst and um, the rest of the procedure was routine uh, we ate up the cyst and did a little bit of laser at the retinotomy site and uh, a gas was used as a tamponade <laughs> and the final outcome was wonderful the patient recovered six by six vision the second case was a little more difficult and this patient was a 20, 20 year female patient again treated for recurrent uveitis and you know loaded with steroids and on the b scan we could see a you know encycling cyst in the pars plena area the whole cyst was tubular and it was like an encycling band on the uh, covering the whole nasal area and there was no space to get in so first i created a retinotomy uh, allowed the fluid to ingress inside so that i can get a cleavage plane to remove that and the second retinotomy was made near the first retinotomy to now hold the loosened cyst. And it was, you know, not a round sheet, it was a tubular because of the location in the pars plena area, near the pars plena area. And uh, it was difficult, you know, to grab with the forceps alone. So a combination of grabbing with the forceps and uh, <clears throat> uh, using a mild section from the cutter uh, helped me take it out in one piece. Because it was going inside again and again when I... Uh, you know, loosen the grip around it. Finally, the whole cyst came out and we were able to eat it again and aspirate it with the cutter. Of course, in this case, there were two retinotomies in the far periphery, uh, inferior nasal, so we used oil as a tamponade. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Where is your form? Where is your form? I make sure I don't come anywhere close to it. <laughs> Sir? Farm fresh eggs, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Where is your farm? I'll make sure I don't come in your close <laughs> and to it. Sounds like you should lot of eggs. Yeah. <laughs> the second one, could it could we have removed it trans clearly? Okay. With the forceps, sir? No, no. Trans clearly. Okay. You don't, you localize it, then okay. make an incision on the sclera. Mm -hmm. Then I use, what I use is the endocryoprobe. Okay. So, so okay. once the cyst you wall is it. exposed, you put the endocryoprobe and you can remove trans clearly rather than going because it's sub sufficient in the periphery yeah. so you can remove yeah. trans clearly. Thank you, sir. It's like a, uh, give a cut. Like a SRF drainage, what we do for a I scleral buckler. But here, cut will be a little bit larger one. Of the size you have to cut through capsule because there will be a capsule around it. Yeah. And once you cut that one, it get it just pops out partly. Yeah. But you will have to nudge it. And, and comes you know that your cryoprobe, you can touch it and yes. And what happened in the first case, also similar. Exactly what happened because whatever your light, your movements in the eye, turbulence, stimulate the cyst and it start moving yeah. away. And there is a tendency because if it goes under the phobia, then you are in trouble because there are one case we realized trying to remove and the colleagues try to just poke through phobia now because that was the thinnest part. Oh, so you really have to hurry about 
So the water, and generally you need an active suction. You hold it, grab it, and just suck that out. I mean, done very well. You know, you're a good surgeon. We know all that about your thing. technique. That's not issue, but yes. The second one, obviously, I would have attempted transfer. Externally. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Sunil. This is some something new kind of uh, two macro hold together, handling together. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as MPSR uh, rightly pointed out earlier, you can use any tissue to plug the macular holes or the pits. Let me show you the what I did for this case. He's a 45-year-old male presented with a progressive loss of vision. He had a previous history of uh, vitrectomy for a macular hole uh, six months back. The best corrected visual equity was 6 by 60. You can see a two full thickness macular hole, the primary hole which is uh, recurrent and large and there is an accessory macular hole, could be an iatrogenic one which was created adjacent to that. You can see the OCT, there is a bridging tissue between the two holes. The primary hole, recurrent hole was almost around 1300 microns and the accessory hole was around 838 microns. So the options I thought of was taking an ILM graft, uh, ILM graft from the outside the arcades or uh, taking a neurosensory graft. But the thing here is uh, you need a, uh, two grafts or the other option could be to split the graft into two and plug the two macular holes. So laser the area of the autoretinal, autologous retinal transplantation. So put a BFCL over the posterior pole. So gently dissect the area of transplant within the laser area. The orientation has to be kept properly. Shift it on to the area of the recurrent macular hole. Once you know the size of the hole, plug it and the rest of the tissue you can cut it and split it into two and plug it onto the use to the accessory closure of the accessory macular hole. The key here is you can get an anatomical restoration. We have to look into the functional aspect also. This is a pre-op and this is a four months post-op. You can see that the, both the holes have been sealed. There is an integration of both the retinal flaps into the surrounding retina and development of outer retinal structures on the OCT. Microperimetry, uh, the scotoma persisted, but there was a slight improvement in retinal sensitivity on uh, microperimetry. Vision improved from 660 to 624. So, so macular hole appears to be successfully closed uh, during the whole follow-up. So I would like to have the panel's opinion regarding the any other better ways to manage this or uh, how to go about in such scenarios. Thank you. Uh, as a quick comment from him. Yes, sir. Only one comment. Beautifully done surgery. Congratulations. Sir. Very well done. Very well. This is called retinal tissue harvesting. Or, you know, you can save the as much as retinal tissue and the, uh, the extra tissue you can put it off. Uh, thank that you had a second hole <laughs> so that you can use it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. And as because we are running short of time, so we need to close it down with this beautiful session. Can we have a quick picture of all the, you know, panelists and the speaker? Please come on to us. Thank you.